This is the Real Estate Rookie Show number seven. Hi, I am your co-host, Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Felipe Mejia. And unfortunately, I have nothing witty to say today. <laughs> oh, I'm like waiting in anticipation for you to say something. I'm like, okay, what is she going to call me? If you guys listen to the last episode, episode six, she's like, oh, look, a Gap model Felipe today or something. And I got tons of funny comments about that. Yeah, I even offered for Felipe to do the intro today. I said, this is a one-time deal because I don't have anything witty to say when I introduce you. And he turned me down. So you will never, ever get to introduce the show again. <laughs> oh gosh. See, that's what happens when you're not prepared. Just like in real estate, if you got to take it when you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today we're doing the show a little bit differently. Felipe and I just talk about six things rookies should be doing right now. Yeah. Did you write down six things? Are you prepared? <laughs> I wrote down uh, four things I thought. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. Yeah, of course I wrote down the six things. I have them in front of me. No, I was really excited to do this um, this show because I get a lot of questions like on my Instagram and stuff of like, hey, what are you doing right now You know, during this time, right? It seems like for the past couple of years, everyone's been talking, okay, a downturn is coming. Let me prepare for it. You know, what is it mm -hmm. going to look like? Is it a housing? Is it, are we going to be in war? You know, no one knows. And I feel like now that we're in a situation, unfortunately, like coronavirus, um, you know, this is the time that we're going to talk about these six things that we need to be doing as investors, especially as rookie investors, to, you know, come out of this a little bit stronger, a little bit better. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And so our whole point of the show today is to really focus on what each rookie can be doing and should be doing to, you know, kind of set themselves up for success, you know, during this pandemic and afterwards and for any other future emergencies that come up or different things that you don't think could happen. Like who would have thought, you know, we'd be worried about collecting rent. Yeah. You know, you think that, uh, you know, cash flow producing properties are the safest way. And then you go towards like Airbnb and some of these things. And we're seeing some people get really hurt during this time because like we can't travel and, you know, things like that. So um, let's talk about these six, uh, you know, six topics that even we, uh, you know, me and you uh, decided and said, hey, these are the things that we're definitely going to be doing uh, during this time to uh, to make sure that we can come out better on the other side of of, you know, this pandemic and hopefully everyone's safe and everyone's healthy, uh, you know, practicing social distancing and everyone's family is safe for that. So I'll start, I'll kick it off here. I think the first one that me and Ashley decided were probably one of the strongest things that we need to do during this time is have cash reserves. I think that's really important. And Ashley, I'll, I'll let you go first. Go ahead. Why do you feel like cash reserves are so important during this time? Honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is that I can sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. And even before the pandemic, having cash reserves was really important to me, especially after I found um, Dave Ramsey and, you know, started to become debt free and get my finances in order. Having right. those cash reserves, I sleep so much better at night knowing that something happens. I have that emergency fund that that stashed to, you know, kind of cover, you know, most people have three to six months cash reserves. Really, you could have whatever makes you sleep at night. That's what I always say when someone asks me if you feel comfortable having one month, then that's fine. That That's what works for you. Uh, for me, it is six months uh, cash reserves to cover mortgage, insurance, property taxes on, you know, each property. Absolutely. I agree. Cash reserves are very important. And I know when, when we first met, actually, uh, me and you, we talked about our cash reserves and you thought, oh, Felipe, <laughs> you have a lot of cash reserves. Yeah. And I was like, that helps me sleep at night and I have right. a family, right? So I think everyone's situation is just a little different. If you have kids, if you have, you know, just you and your spouse, or if you're by your by yourself, just single, you know, and doing your thing, then everyone's cash reserve is going to look a little different just based on what they need. And I think ultimately the best definition for for that is going to be, you know, are you, do you have a peace of mind with the res, with the cash reserves that you have? Are you mm -hmm. sleeping at night? You know, the, the, the concept of saying, oh, it lets me sleep at night is really saying I have a peace of mind. And if you have the right cash reserves to weather a certain storm, then you can sleep peaceful at night. Let's say your tenants say, Hey, I, I can't pay rent this month, you know, and the last thing any of us investors wants to do is just kick people to the curve. We'd rather have the heads in the beds. 
So, you know, if you have a little cash reserves, you have a little bit more flexibility than automatically jumping the gun and having to kick someone out, especially during a time like this, where we need to be more, you know, coming together as, as a community and even as a country, uh, you know, rather than dividing ourselves with, oh, well, you can't pay rent. It's landlord against tenant. No, it, it's, we're all in this together. And I think cash reserves gives us as landlords that peace of mind to make decisions uh, you know, properly and things like that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I also think that as an investor, if there was a family that was going through a really true hardship, you know, because of this pandemic or something else, like it would feel great for me to say, you know what, let's work out a deal because I have these reserves. I can, you know, I'm, I'm financially stable and I've gone through hard times too. And that would feel really great. I, Fortunately, most of my tenants have paid as of right now, and no one has reached out saying they're not going to. Um, so we'll see how it pans out. But I think having those cash reserves just puts you in a position um, where you're not only helping your family, but you might have the opportunity to help someone else. And I'm I'm not, you know, all about like letting people live for free and, you know, letting <laughs> We're them. We're still a business, Ashley. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. You. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes there are uh, special circumstances. Sure. And one of the things before I'll let you introduce uh, number two, but before we get off of cash reserves, one of, and I'll ask you the same question. One of the things that I'm doing right now with uh, cash reserves is I've actually told tenants, hey, if it let's pay rent. But if you're missing like food or water or uh, essentials, just just call me. Let's talk about that. Right. If, yeah. if you need groceries, I can have those shipped to you or I can I, you know, we can we can figure out a way to feed your family. We're not we're not going to like kick you out to dry. But let's the the rent is a little non-negotiable, but the rest of it can. I can help you with if you need food, if you need, you know, if you need to pay the water or the light bill, I can help you out there. But let's try to avoid the let's not pay rent, right? And that way, that also gives the tenant a sense of 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 community with you and them, a, a partnership, an agreement. You know, they feel good that that the landlord wants to help them out. You know, so I would rather them say, "Hey, Felipe, you know, I don't have money for the grocery." I got you. That's what my cash reserves are for. And like you said, that makes me feel good that I'm providing for my tenants, right? We're in this together. Do you have an example of something like that, Ashley? I, I haven't done that to anyone, yep. um, have had that opportunity, I guess, which is a good thing that right. everyone's That's, been yeah. in, you know, good there circumstances. Go. But I do want to add to that, um, talking about, um, you know, helping them, everything like that building those relationships with your tenants can really be key during something like this. And of course, there still will be the people that try and take advantage of it. But if you've done your tenant screening and you've got good people who, like um, Lucas Hall said, you want to find people who are willing to pay and can pay, which I thought that added tremendous value um, on last uh, week's episode, that you just don't want to make sure they you know, have the income to pay, but that they want to pay too. Having the availability to pay and also the willing is two separate mm -hmm. things. And I think willing comes with relationship and trust building with that yeah. tenant. And I'll, uh, I'll finish with this. I think cash reserves gives you options. I think cash reserves give you options in a, in a, in a, in a tight situation. And you would yeah. rather have options in a tight situation than having to like, oh my gosh, freak out and figure it out. Well, let's move on to number two. So this can kind of go along with cash reserves because it can be an option for you, um, a second strategy per se, or second exit strategy. Securing HELOCs in long-term debt during this time. When you have a line of credit, um, even if you don't have one now, go and open one now. Use your primary residence, use an investment property, and have that av available. You don't have to draw from it. A lot of times they're interest only payments. So you're only paying if you take money off of that. But if you run out of your cash reserves, this can be, you know, plan B to start, um, you know, supporting your business if you have that line of credit. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, long term debt? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, and let me touch base a little bit a lot about line of credit and then we'll, we'll for long term okay. debt. I actually use my line of credit before I use my cash be, uh, during mm -hmm. this time. Right. Okay. And I'll explain why. Now, in the past, yeah, I would use cash and line of credit together. But right now to get through this uh, pandemic and I hate even using that word, but it is, um, you know, I'm using my line of credit. Let's say I use one hundred dollars for something, then I'm going to pay a certain small percentage on that monthly 
Uh, but that hundred dollars buys me 30, 60 days, you know, and right. that's sometimes what you need. And then my cash, I'm using a small portion of it to hold that loan until I can pay it back once we're past this pandemic. Then what I'll do is use some more, like, let's say I'm allocating uh, 16% of rents towards my line of credit. Maybe I'll up it to 25 once we get out of this pandemic to pay it off sooner and then just go back. But everyone has a different scenario on how, but actually right now I'm using my lines of credit uh, and backing it up with my cash when in the past I would probably go 50, 50 or something like that to not be over leveraged. Yeah. Right. So just trying to use it strategically. And another thing that I did, and this is really cool. I called my bank and I told them, Hey, I know that I was paying uh, $500 a month towards the line of credits debt, some of it towards principal, some of it towards interest. But now I'd like to break that in half while we're through this pandemic. Can I switch it down to 250 a month? And they're like, yeah, your payment's yeah. only 70 bucks. Um, off of your 30, I think I'm like at $30,000 on my line of credit used for yeah. a properties that I was renovating. And they were like, yeah, you actually only have like a 70, $80 that you have to pay. And I was like, okay, so let's go down from 500 to 250. So that's why I personally love wow. lines of credit because I have that flexibility of how much I want to pay during certain situations. I went on a tangent there, but you, you, no, you get what I'm I saying. No, I think that was great information. That was really interesting to hear that you do your line of credit first before you get into your cash reserves and thinking about it. Like if I have to start breaking into my cash reserves, I think there would actually be a point where I would say, you know what, I'm stopping right here at my cash reserves, maintaining, you know, this minimum balance and I'm going to start using my line of credit um, so that that's really interesting. I, I'm glad you shared that with me. <laughs> Hopefully everyone <laughs> yeah, else got I feel it like valuable. We, we, we both learn a lot all the time when we talk this. Well, I just want to add too real quick is um, how you just asked your bank. And it just, once again, it's one of those things I like to harp on is just you, you don't know until you ask. And that's that it. I just asked. I just called in. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, hey, what what my minimum payment is what? And she's like, oh, it's 70 bucks. And I was like, okay, well, I was doing an automatic payout of 500. Can I break yep. it in half during this pandemic? She's like, yep, you can do what you need yep. to do. Perfect. So you asked me about long-term debt. Um, I want to touch base on that a little bit. Um, for example, and I'll give a perfect example because I'm in this situation right now. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that. Um, I actually have a five-year, like a small five-year mortgage on a rental, on a property that I didn't want to lose. I got a, it's, you would, you could consider it a bad loan because it's got a high interest rate, but I wanted this yeah. property and I was okay with losing a little bit of cash flow for the first three or four years because I knew that I was going to get into a 30-year mortgage. I was just waiting to see when. And I kind of calculated, I said, okay, we've been in a really good market for the past eight or nine years. Something's bound to happen in the next five. So I'm going to get this bad loan. I call it a bad loan because it takes out about a hundred extra bucks of my cash flow to cover the extra interest payments. Mm -hmm. And now I'm refinancing it into a 30 year mortgage with a very low interest rate, um, you know, versus what I had because, right. you know, we're in this situation. And I always say, take advantage of the situation. Don't take advantage of the people. And by, what I mean by that is now I'm refinancing into a long term debt with that property, it's only going to, my mortgage, I think shifts like maybe 60 bucks. My cash flow is great. I'm going to be in a 30 year mortgage at a fixed rate. It's clean. It's simple. Right. And I, I, I tell, I tell people, look at your debt right now and get it into a long-term low interest rate. Yeah. You really want to get away from any balloon payments. That's what so it was. A balloon, yeah. A balloon payment is if you are making, you know, small payments, you know, for a year or two years, but then at the end of the two years, you owe the remaining balance. And, you know, a lot of times you, with not knowing what's going on or what's going to be coming up within the next few months, if you have something, a balloon payment coming up, we're going to owe this lump sum. I would recommend, you know, getting something lined up now so that you're prepared for when that balloon payment comes due. And that's always been one thing. Um, I did do a balloon payment once. It was seller financing. I did interest only payments for one year. And then I had that balloon payment where it gave me a year to fix up the property. And then I went and refinanced with a bank and that worked out fine. We actually closed the day before my balloon payment uh, was wow. due. Yeah. <laughs> Cutting it close <laughs> there, Ashley. <laughs> yeah, and it actually we set it up that way. It, it, it wasn't nerve wracking at all, as bad as it sounds, but um, that sounds pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it worked out well. But um, right now, I'd recommend long term debt for even if you have um, maybe five year um, commercial loans. If those are, you know, maybe switching to a variable variable rate coming soon. Um, I would get into a fixed rate. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Geez, thanks for breaking that down. I don't 
fully understand the way the balloons work. There's a lot of jargon there. I graduated like last in my high school class, so I don't even want to get into that. But I was like, she kind of explained it to me. And I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense. I wish I would have known a little more. But I knew right now that what I needed to do was get into long-term right. debt, you know, secured long-term 30-year um, debt. So yeah, thanks for explaining that. Cause and, I wouldn't and have- it's not like balloon payments are bad. It can definitely mm-hmm. be an advantage um, yep. to you, but you want to have those multiple strategies as to, okay, if I can't get bank financing for that balloon payment, then why don't we go ahead and, you know, do I have a, a private lender who would, you know, come and cover that balloon payment or hard money lender? Yeah, absolutely. So I think having those multiple options or maybe you have a line of credit you would draw off instead or you have another house that you would, you know, take a mortgage on to cover this balloon payment. Actually, will you explain what balloon payment is, um, you know, for everyone listening? What, 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 break down how that balloon works. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a, an example with numbers. So sure. you're purchasing a property for $100,000. And I'll use, you know, a seller financing example here. So sure. Felipe is selling me his property for $100,000. He wants $5,000 down um, at closing. And then I'm going to be paying interest payments to him for one year. Um, say interest is 7%. And, you know, I can't do that math off the top of my head, but let's just say I'm paying him $150 a month or whatever at 95,000. It's going to be more than that. But so (laughs) each month I'll pay him that $150. Then on month 12, he is going to want that $95,000 paid to him in one lump sum. So that's where I would have to plan ahead to get bank financing a couple months ahead or, you know, line up where I'm getting that 95,000 from. And there are banks that do balloon payments too, where the bank will, you know, maybe you're even paying principal and interest over, you know, a certain term, and then you'll make that lump sum payment um, at a future date. So instead of amortizing like a conventional loan where it's, you know, fixed rate for 15, 20, 30 years, and it's, you're making principal payments. And at the end of that term, end of the 15 years, you're, everything's paid off. This is where you're paying a little bit. And then it's one big lump sum payment. And that's what we call a balloon payment. Nice. Everyone needs to <laughs> listen to that. I'm going to go back and listen to that because I think you explained it better than my banker did. She was just like, well, this is what we can do. You can't get it. I'm like, whoa, okay. We can get the property. We can cash flow. Okay, good. I'll have to figure that yeah. part out later. But it was on the back burner, but I didn't want to forget about it. So great right. explanation of how that balloon works and how you can use it to your advantage. Be careful though. It is a two-edged sword. You got a certain term, one, two, five years, depending on what your bank offers you. The next topic that we had there, um, we're not on to number three yet, just the second part of securing HELOCs and long-term debt is make yourself bankable. And um, basically what I feel like saying make yourself bankable means making sure your taxes are in order, making sure your cash flow is in order. Right now during this time of quarantine, take advantage if you can, jump on your computer, you know, clean up your Excel sheets or clean up your QuickBooks or whatever the case may be that you're using to... um, you know, keep your properties in order, just make it very nice and clean. I have found out that banks work so much better when you have your your things organized and clean. And if they're if if they're asking for like, okay, can I see the rent roll? Right. You don't want to be like, oh my gosh, okay, so this person pays this person. Like if you have a very clean cut sheet or you know, you have a program that you use, you can just turn it in and banks love that. They love to see that you are responsible in your business and things like that. So uh, that's one of the ways that I've, I've made myself bankable. Ashley, what about you? Well, I think it's really important to call a local bank and see what they want from you. What, oh, good. what does their application look for? They can email it to you. Take a look at it. Some of them even have it on their website and it will list what documentation they also want from you. You know, a copy of your driver's license, two or three years of tax returns, you know, four weeks of pay stubs. I I think it's really important to make sure you have all those things in order. Like Felipe said, you want to be prepared. You want to be organized, have these things available. Maybe you just have a folder on your desktop, but you also want to make sure that, you know, your credit is in great shape too, that you're going to be able to get a good interest rate and that they'll even want to lend to you. You know, if you don't have that grade of credit, take this time to clean that up, you know, work on getting your, your payments on time, work on, you know, getting any judgments paid off. I, credit is a, a very important tool. And if you want to secure that, those home equity lines of credit and that long-term debt, your credit is going to be a huge factor into whether or not you're going to be able to be bankable. 
Yeah, that's right. In the middle of this um, refinance that I was telling you about a minute ago, getting into a long-term 30-year mortgage, I was very surprised in a way where he said, we want to make sure that you have a good amount of cash reserves. And I was like, wow, I've never been asked how much like cash yeah. reserves I have in the bank. Like this is the first time I was asked that. Um, and, and I was able to show, okay, I, I, this is what I have for cash reserve. So you're able to use that cash reserve as, you know, in different ways, that same money, you know, the, the refinance is going to, I believe it's going to go through, um, because we have a nice little, uh, cash reserve there and they're not worried about us missing payments and stuff like that. Yeah, that's definitely the more you can show the bank, um, you know, the assets you have and that you are an asset is very yeah. important. I always like to add to that um, when you're going to a bank to get financing on a deal, maybe it's your refinancing or you want to purchase a deal is bring the deal to them. You know, do the bigger pockets calculator report and show them what the numbers look like, what your cash flow is going to be, how this property will pay the mortgage payment, what your rents are going to be. Um, you know, give them as much information about the property as you can to make them feel secure and be like, wow, this looks great. And if this is your first time approaching a bank and you've done other deals before, bring, put a little binder together with your portfolio, showing them the other deals you've done and how successful they have been. Bring pictures, show them, you know, a lot of information to kind of, because they're going to be you know, they look at your portfolio, they look at that you want to keep doing this, they're going to want to maintain you um, as a partner. I like what you said a minute ago, you said be an asset to the bank. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you worded it like that, but that's true. Be an asset to the bank, not a lot of not a liability. And everyone loves an asset, right? Um, so that actually goes into what we're our next topic is, which is, um, so the first one was cash reserves. The second one is securing HELOCs, long term debts, be bankable. Our third rookie thing that you should be doing right now is be analyzing deals, right? Deal analysis, tight numbers, estimating repairs, practicing and, uh, you know, uh, in your market and where you want to be is very crucial, especially right now. And I'll give you a perfect example. I'm used to buying properties. Um, in my area for about 200 to 220. That's that's just typical mm -hmm. for me within the $20,000 range because I know my market so well. I have a property right now under contract for 185. So I feel like the market's shifting a little, but it's because I know that area. My realtor sent me the listing and I didn't even have to fully look at the property. I said, I know what street that is. I know what houses are built on that street. I know it works for my portfolio. She said, the price is 199. I said, offer 185 and they took it, right? Mm -hmm. So deal analysis right now is very important because if you are bankable, if you have cash reserves, if you're securing long-term debt, you are able to continue to purchase properties. So that's a perfect example of just continuing to analyze deals because when one comes at you, you are able to make a move on it, pounce on it, if you will. Yeah. And I want to talk about the numbers. So you mentioned having tight numbers. You, you don't want to overestimate what the rents are. Don't say, you yep. know what? I think I can get, you know, a thousand dollars a month really do your research and look at other listings go to you know even craigslist facebook marketplace apartments.com and look at what other properties are listed for in your area start a little excel sheet saying okay here's the addresses these are what they're rented for go back and check every week are these places getting rented are they still being listed and just kind of track it for a while and you'll start to see a pattern okay this apartment that was for 600 for a two bedroom that it rented immediately. It's no longer listed. Or you can even call around and call property management places and just, you know, say, hey, what what apartment does this apartment complex rent for and stuff like that. And, you know, really lowball your rent income. Yeah, I want to, when I see a, a deal analysis, I want to see the lowest you can get on there as your number because, you know, going forward, if, if we have another recession, you might see rents drop or you might see them increase. You don't know, but you wouldn't you rather have that rent increase as just extra money, you know, extra cash flow that's not, you know, already worked into your numbers. And then I want to see insurance, property tax, you know, water, uh, garbage fees, all of those fixed expenses. I want to see you overinflate those. You, d you don't know when your property taxes are going to be reassessed. So the city of Buffalo did a, an assessment this year and my property taxes went up. I've owned the building for three years and it's it's still not as high as I had it put in as my property tax number when I ran the deal because I always like to put that little buffer in knowing that going forward, my property taxes aren't going to kill my deal if they are going to go up. So I always like to overinflate um, as much as I can. But, you know, I 
don't over exaggerate where you're never going to find <laughs> a deal. That's where you get into deal analysis paralysis. Don't go yeah. way overboard. Um, one of the things that I do with finding tenants and making sure that I get or that I know my numbers regarding what tenants can pay or be willing to pay for, right. for rooms and stuff is I see what other people are posting and I'm like, okay, how long did it take Joe Schmo to rent mm -hmm. his room that he had up for $800? Oh, it looks like Billy Joe Bob put his for 600 and it went off the market in two days. You know, Joe Schmo over here has got it, you know, for, you know, three months and still hasn't rented it. I'm going to probably get somewhere in the middle, take some really good pictures, a really good description, maybe even a video. And then I'm going to fall in the middle and I know I'm going to get taken up pretty quick. So I don't want to be at the top. I run my numbers at the bottom, but I rent in the middle. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look at the top. I say, okay, that's, that's a potential. I know that I can get this. So I'm going to rent right in the middle. And that's that. But, but like you said, I, I, I run my numbers based on mm -hmm. the bottom. Yeah. That that's a great advice because I'll, I'll do one as the exact numbers, like as of today, what, like if it's already rented or what I think I can get right now, and then what the exact property taxes are to the dollar, what the exact insurance would be. And then I run it like that. And then I run the, you know, the inflated one, making sure that it, that it still works that way. And that's kind of what I go off of the inflated one because property taxes can change. Insurance can pay change. You might get a, a tenant that, you know, washes their car every single day in the driveway <laughs> and your water bill goes up. I end Actually, up when I go to properties, I, I take off the hoses. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have a quick oh, story real gone. quick. This tell one me, property me. I bought, it was maybe my fourth or fifth one. And when I did the inspection, I like wrote down like the faucet for the exterior of the house isn't even hooked up. Like we want that fixed. And the, the guy told me, he said, well, I do that so that they can't wash their car in the driveway. And I'm like, Great idea. Leave that <laughs> makes sense. I'm going to yeah. do that. They would have to pay a plumber or somebody to come out. That's hilarious. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, so actually deal analysis, yes, is very important, guys. Definitely be doing that. And that kind of filters into our, our, our next topic. Uh, Ashley, do you want to bring that in for us? We're going to talk about leases and going forward what your lease should have or shouldn't have. Because I... I bet a lot of you don't have uh, pandemics listed in your lease as to what's going to happen. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Steve Rosenberg on the show, and he actually shared with me uh, his emergency preparedness manual that his property management company uses. And I, I thought that was very great. And they even had a section on it about pandemics and what the steps the property management company will take and what steps the the residents should expect and what they should, you know, do during this time. And they, you know, they had it listed for if there was a war, you know, if there was a fire, if there was a flood, a hurricane, you know, it goes so on and so on. And you don't need anything, you know, large like that. And I'm sure you can go out and, you know, purchase samples or find uh, free samples probably online of an emergency preparedness manual and kind of tailor it yourself. But let's talk about uh, leases. Like w what's one thing you think you're going to add to your leases going forward on renewals or any new tenants you get? Absolutely. So I love this topic because revising your lease right now is very important as, you know, whether you have a lease coming up, uh, you know, one of your tenants lease is coming up and you have to renew the lease, you might want to add something about pandemics and how you're going to you know, accept or not accept certain rents or deferred rents or whatever the case may be, but giving, you know, tenant maybe that option. And I would revise my lease now going forward every year. And what I would do is probably call my bank and say, hey, what options do I have if, you know, we're in a pandemic or we're in a war, you know, because the banks surely are going to have something. Um, and then you'll be able to kind of reflect that onto your lease and say, okay, if my tenant can't pay, I know the bank does this, so I'm going to kind of merge that because you're just the person in the middle, right? Rent comes in, you take the cash flow, you pay off your mortgage. So I think for me personally is I'm going to have a little bit better communication with my bank, find out what options I can give to my tenants going forward if we ever have a pandemic again or a war or things that are possible that can happen. And you want to make sure you have those in the lease. Uh, I believe Brandon Turner from the OG show says that his lease is like 14 pages long. Like that's that I, I, when I first heard that, I was like, that's insane. Mine is like four, but I get that now. Like you have to think of every possible situation and really protect yourself. So when it comes to leases, I'm definitely going to be revising my lease and making sure that I have an open communication with my bank to what options that I can forego to my tenants. Yeah, I think the lease has definitely become more and more important 
for me um, than it did when I first started. When I first started out as a property manager, it was a two page lease that was given to me when I started the job to start doing. And, you know, I think mine is maybe now up to seven pages, I think. And uh, but I love to use it as the rule book, the law or, you know, it's the decision maker. You know, instead yeah. of being the bad guy, I say, you know, it's actually it's it says in the lease that, you know, this is what we would do or, you know, this is right. what happens or, you know, you're responsible for this per the lease. You know, we both agreed upon this when you moved in. So I really like to rely on my lease for the for that kind of thing. And I think with the pandemic, you know, thinking about other things that should be added in. I really don't know if there is such a thing as a, a lease that's too long. <laughs> yeah. But um, I remember when I it was I probably worked for a property or worked as a property manager for a year. And the guy who worked for his daughter was in college and she moved into like an apartment complex that um, was student housing. And I the lease was like 32 pages long. And I remember going through this and I mean, just every single little detail and they had to initial by each paragraph, you know, that they read it, acknowledged it and and went through it all. I thought that was overkill at the time. But now <laughs> as I've had more and more experience, I, I kind of think that there's no such thing as a, a lease that's too long. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I think revising your lease right now is very crucial, especially if some of uh, you know, we're supposed to be quarantined to our home. If we're not supposed to be out socializing, take this time to revise your lease. Make sure that you're that it's it's tip top, you know, every every uh, T is crossed and every I is dotted to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks. Add things about a pandemic, you know, from because you're living it. So, you know, add yeah. those things to that lease. And I think that's I think that's very important to make sure that you're revising your lease, having an emergency manual prepared and just, uh, you know, really, really, really tightening that belt of, oh, OK, you know, we're in the past. We're like, OK, I'm sure everyone can pay the rent. We're in a great market. We're going to be OK. You, you have a very skinny lease. Right. Think right now the time is to really time to beef up your lease. Yeah. One thing that I would like to add going forward in a lease is talking about uh, resources. So, you know, I, my property management company did a great job of blasting out emails to residents and this all started going on listing resources where if they're not going to be able to pay where they can get assistance from. And I think that would be a great thing to put into the leases. If there is a circumstance where you can't pay, you know, whether it's because of a pandemic or something else, please visit these resources ahead of time or first, you know, before coming to us and, you know, try to do that. And I think that there is a lot of help and resources and grants or, you know, social security welfare, a lot of different programs that can help people pay rent. And I'd like to be more proactive on that of, you know, being able to provide people with these resources so that it benefits both of us going forward. And, you know, in the lease, I would like to put in there if, you know, you can't pay and you reach out to these resources, you know, I, th I think that will make a, a better relationship between us, um, knowing that I, I want to help them as much as possible. But here, try these resources first. I agree. I think that builds a uh, tenant relationship, tenant rapport and things like that. OK, yeah. so we've talked about cash reserves. We've talked about securing HELOCs. We've talked about deal analysis and revising your lease. So moving on to the next part of our six things that rookies should be doing is partnerships. So if you've put these things into place, you probably expect your partner, if you're going to get into a partnership with somebody, to maybe have done the same amount of research or be at least educated in you know what, what you want to do and bring to the table. So when it comes to partnerships, mindsets, make sure that they're bankable, make sure that their strategies align with you in the future. Who do you want to partner with? Be looking at what you want to partner with and who's doing something at this time. So there's a lot there. So let's break that down. One of the things that I was telling Ashley prior to the show was, hey, if I'm looking for a partner, I'm looking at what they're doing right now and how they are reacting during this time. Are they, you know, running around, you know, pandemic really just freaking them out. They're not, they don't know what to do with their rents. You know, they have a lot going on and they're not prepared. It's probably someone that I'm not going to want to partner with in the future. So right now, if you have an idea that, oh, I want to partner with someone this year and buying another rental property, or I'm looking at this potential person, you know, really be scouting that person and seeing how they're reacting during this time. Are they doing what me and Ashley are saying here? You know, are they revising their leases, getting bankable, you know, continuing uh, the good fight of, you know, renting, uh, buying, buying and hold properties? Are they doing things that align with what you want for your goals? 
and really just get, are they in that right mindset to, you know, weather this storm and get, you know, great advances on the other side. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm looking at people that I potentially want to partner with and seeing what they're doing during this time, which is going to tell me what they're going to do in the future. If this happens again, if we're in partnerships together. Since like, if I would have known this pandemic was going to happen, and sure. if I would have known Felipe was going to quarantine himself in Cocoa Beach or not Co Daytona Beach, da right? Daytona. Daytona Beach, Florida. And I was going to be stuck here where it's currently snowing today. I would have said no, <laughs> knowing that last week <laughs> I had to watch his beach view of, you know, the ocean, the beach from doing the podcast. And today I have it snowing in my window. I've said, no, I don't want to partner with him on this podcast. <laughs> Ashley doesn't want to partner with me anymore. I have this beautiful tan out here from Daytona, yeah. Florida. <laughs> I'm glowing I just keep getting whiter and whiter. <laughs> no, all but it's true. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and so, She's but still I want to, I know, I want to talk about how you talked about like finding the partner and how they handle what's going on right now. How are they handling this situation? And I think it'll be very important to, to watch that, to see if they're going to be a good partner going forward. I, I want to make sure that my partners are, you know, are saving their cash reserves still. They're, they're not freaking out. They're remaining <laughs> calm and cool in that they're in it for the long term. They're not, you know, texting me to say, hey, we should sell right now before the market drops. Like, I'm looking for people who are in this for the long term. And right now is a great time to study those potential partners or even your cur current partners if you're going to continue to do deals with them. How are they handling this thing someone thought wasn't going to happen? I mean... Right. Who would have expect, expected a, you know, a year ago that we would be worried about collecting rent and be quarantined in our homes? And, you know, how is your partner making use of this time? Or maybe they're more busy um, and don't have the time to, you know, grow your empire or whatever <laughs> during this time. But it's definitely something to keep an eye out if you are looking to partner with someone is how they're handling it, it now. I agree 100%. And, Finding and the right even, partner is crucial. Sorry, yeah, not even a, a like your business partner, but also how is your accountant, you know, your CPA oh, handling yeah. this? How is your attorney handling this? How is your property management company handling this? How is the bank handling this? Are you trying to get an SBA loan? Is your bank helping you, you know, through that process? I did one for my dad on Friday and he, or on Monday, and he uses a bank that I've never banked with. And it was the worst process ever. And I'm like, you need to switch banks, go to one of my banks. And yeah, that's true. I, so I didn't I think, think about this, your partnerships with those. Yeah. So those are all pe people that are part of your partnerships. What's that? Um, the book, it's called uh, something about how the, you know, all of these connections, the as an entrepreneur, these are your key people. I think it's called something like that. Keep We'll put it in the show notes, but it's how, you know, your accountant, your lawyer, all these people really help you grow your business and they are a part of your partnership. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. Partnerships are crucial. And I didn't even think about reassessing my bank, my realtor, my, you mm -hmm. know, everyone yeah. that's in my bubble that helps me grow. You know, who is your team? We should have named this team players, not just partnerships. But yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. true. Like we need to we need to to be evaluating everyone and how they are reacting to this in a positive or negative way. You know, are they out there still on the grind or are they saying, nope, I'm not going to send you any more deals. I have this to worry about. I'm, you know, so yeah, that's that's perfect. I love that. Double check everyone in your team. Make sure that everyone's positively affecting you. Um, and then, you know, reevaluating if we need to make some changes on the other side. Um, and that's okay. I do it with contractors all the time. So no need to not look at the rest of my team as well. You want to introduce the last one there, Ashley? Mindset. So this is something Felipe and I both love and like to focus on is yes. your mindset. I think it plays a very important role in being a successful investor, especially if you want to be a, a long-term buy and hold investor. You can't panic or freak out or you know, you really have to have your mindset in a good place to handle these things, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. Mindset is crucial during this time. And one of the things that I was actually telling my mother-in-law, because that's who we're quarantined with out here in Daytona, um, I was telling her, I was like, I feel like a lot of times people get emotionally attached to their money, which makes them make emotional decisions with their money. Like during this time, they're, they're like, oh, I got to hoard all this cash and I don't want to invest any of it. And I'll just wait till the other side to start investing again. 
which is kind of the opposite of what uh, I think people should be doing. I think right now I would be still looking for analyzing deals, making sure the numbers work and still investing that money, not being emotionally attached to my money, but more of a mindset where, okay, this money has to get deployed to make me more cash flow and, and not being scared that the market's dropping. So we all talked about, right? Oh, once mm -hmm. the market drops, I can't wait to buy more rental properties. This is a perfect time for something like that for you to look at the market, analyze a property, make sure that the numbers work, and then pull the trigger. It's it's that pull the trigger on buying a property that you know is gonna work if you've ran your numbers correctly. And Bigger Pockets has great calculators for this, right? Uh, deal analysis, burrs, flips, there's great, uh, you know, on Bigger Pockets, you can see all those calculators and you can use them. Um, and I think if you have the pro membership, you can actually, there's, there's just a lot more that opens up to you. Yeah, but. it's unlimited. You can use it unlimited times. Uh, you can go to biggerpockets.com forward slash calc. And if you don't have a pro membership, uh, you can do at least run five deals for free um, on the nice. calculator reports. Yeah. Yeah. So using that, you know, to to take the emotion out of it and just seeing the numbers. You have to just be able to see the numbers, take your emotion out of it. And, uh, you know, my youth pastor when I was young would always tell me, Felipe, numbers don't lie. They tell a story. And that, and that's mm -hmm. it. If you can, if you can get, you know, yourself away from the emotional attachment of your money is attached to this, that, the other, just say, what do the numbers tell me? And I go from there. And that's the reason you have cash reserves too, is so that if something like this happens, that's what they're there for. And you can't be afraid to use your cash reserves because th that's what they're there for. They're that safety net. You should be saving them for rainy days, you know, like right. this. And, exactly. um, and, and this don't is the get, rainy day, right? And if you, and don't get yourself defeated, if you have to go into those cash reserves or you, if you have to tap into that line of credit, but make sure you're doing everything you can to, you know, help your tenants find those resources to pay. You, you, this is still a business. And as much as we want to help them, you, you still have to, you know, prioritize your family too. I mean, my family relies on the rental income. Your family relies on the rental income. And you have to have that mindset where you don't, you don't want to be, you know, a dictator is to pay the rent now or I'm knocking on the door. But, and you also don't want to be like, yo, it's okay. Just don't pay me for six months either because then your business is going to fail. You have to, you have to find that, that happy medium. Mindset, super crucial. And the last thing I'll say about mindset, and I know Ashley's going to love this as well, is get involved in an REI meeting, get involved in Facebook mm -hmm. groups. Definitely. I mean, Real Estate Rookie on Facebook group. Follow us there. And let me say something about Real Estate Rookie real quick. Guys, when you are requesting to be on there, make sure that you are uh, agreeing to the terms because a lot of people are requesting to be on there and they don't hit that. They agree to the terms of, 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 the, of, of the Real Estate Rookie. So make sure that you are saying, yes, you agree to the terms or we cannot put you on there. I think we've denied uh, four or five people because of that. So go back, make sure that you uh, that you agree to the terms and conditions of the of, of the Facebook group. We want to make sure that everyone's safe and that, you know, there's not a bunch of salesy, pitchy stuff out there. We really want a community and a tribe of rookies that are, are bouncing ideas off of each other. And me and Ashley are on there all the time. So and definitely go do that. And I think that's really growing too. I, I We've had so many people be interactive in there and yeah. such great, I mean, I things are posted and there's like immediately people are commenting, giving advice or asking, yes. you know, a, a follow-up question. I, I'm loving all of the interaction that everyone has on there. So if you haven't joined yet, just search real estate rookie on Facebook and become a part of it. And we've actually been doing some of our shows live on Facebook too, on the bigger pockets page. So make sure you guys follow that page as well. But uh, let's talk more about uh, meetups and yes. even mastermind groups, because that goes along with mindset. And I even wanted to talk about that today is that can be something really important for uh, rookies to be involved with. Yeah, absolutely. The importance of having your tribe is crucial because during these times is when you're going to rely on that. I don't know about you guys, but me personally, I don't have a lot of friends in real estate. Uh, to my best, one of my best friends is a stay at home dad. And, and I think that's awesome. Don't get me wrong, but I just don't have other people to lean on when it comes to real estate investing. So you I mean, rely like on the in people real life. Me. Like you have yeah, all yeah, your yeah, online sorry. friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have all my online friends. Yeah. I bounce ideas off of them all the time, Join but in Facebook real life, so you can be Felipe's friend. <laughs> <laughs> be my friend, please. I don't have friends. No, my friends are not invested in real estate and I'm okay with that. I love them to death, but they, I just can't tell them, Hey, can you, you know, what do you think about this ROI on this property? They'd be like, dude, what is ROI? Like they don't care. And that's okay because I've built my relationships with friends and family based on relationships, not based on money and stuff. 
But what I'm trying to say is you still got to have that tribe to back you up. So find those people in your community, in your city, uh, you know, find those people that are going to hold you accountable to your goals and then that you're able to bounce ideas off of as well. I feel like a lot of times people come and tell me like, dude, I found some of my best deals at REI meetings and at, or at my tribes. Now uh, meetups are all virtual <laughs> right now because you can't meet in person. So you can join a, a mastermind group. There's tons of paid and free ones that, you know, they're virtual all the time. Or maybe you even have a, a local, you know, mastermind group. But th let's talk about the difference between a mastermind and the, the difference between a meetup. So a meetup sure. is usually free or a small fee and you go when you can and it's just anybody can come to that. Where, yep. and you know, maybe there's a different topic you discuss or it's just a social happy hour and you just connect with people during that. Maybe yep. the one that I go to in Buffalo, um, like there's a 15 minutes in the, the beginning where the guy that leading it talks a little bit and then there's a guest speaker and then you know you break out and just connect with people the rest of the time and then a mastermind group that's more focused on what your current goal is that's exactly right so when you have a mastermind it's more of a directed like okay i'm felipe this is my goal can you guys help me keep me accountable to this? And mm -hmm. if you're paying for that, you know, you have someone that's going to be grinding you, that's going to be helping you, that's going to be pushing you. And you it's 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 more of like uh, if you go to the gym, let me use this example. If you go to the gym, the open gym is social. Everyone can go. It's great. That's an REI meeting. You see power lifters, you see CrossFit, you see swimmers, you see it all right. But you're like, dude, I really want to get my bench press level up. I really want to get this massive just big numbers on the bench press. You hire a coach to get you past that peak. Let's say that you're at a peak, right? So that's where that's where that's how I use the example as a mastermind. A mastermind is like a coach that's directly correlated to your goal. My goal is, you know, 10 properties by the end of the year. I want to join a mastermind that's going to make me do that. So I think you those know, are the difference I, between REIs and mastermind. I'm loving all your analogies lately because <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect. That perfectly explains, explains it. We're going to be more focused. So my point of talking about all this is if you are not involved in a meetup or a mastermind and you want to be in one of them, start your research now and finding one in your area. And now, now is the time to start looking because, you know, for a meetup, there might be some virtual ones, but you're not going to be missing the the in-person ones and you can take your time to find the right fit for you or even a mastermind group. And then even a mentor. Um, if you want a mentor, that can even be more one-on-one. -on -one. If you, if you would prefer that than a large social setting, um, find a mentor, you know, look, search people on Facebook, Instagram, social media, you know, I'm, there's probably people that would do it for free. And then there, there's some pay people too, but I've never heard at least in my experience, had anyone tell me that it wasn't worth paying for a mentor? What about yeah, you? Have absolutely. You, I mean, there's the guru uh, people out there, but there's, yeah, there's the, all the gurus. There's the pay me a million dollars and I'll like, teach you the, how to buy one, one rental on property. Ones, I've, yeah. The one-on-ones -on -ones, <laughs> I've never heard of anyone saying that there, there's no value in that. You know, tons of people that I know that are legit in the real estate yeah. talk about adding value to like someone bringing value to them and then they'll be able to reciprocate. Right. I mm -hmm. get tons of messages, you know, on my DM that it's like this, like 20 paragraph thing of like how they want to add value to me. And I'm like, I'm going to read none of that. <laughs> so when you're looking for a mentor or you want to just add quick value to them, bring yeah. something to the table. And then, you know, that's, I feel like that's going to be the quickest way. build a on, you know what, even past pay, build an honest relationship with who you want to mentor from be genuine. That's going to get you a lot farther than, Hey, here's a million dollars. Can you mentor? Well, a million dollars. Right. Maybe yeah. Allocate, that, that is very true. And be genuine. I, the person that mentors me, he said to me, you know, what I believe in what goes around comes around that if I help you that in some way, I'm going to be helped it in another way. And I so right now I'm, I'm managing a social media. Account. <laughs> oh God, you love social media. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I know who it is. I won't name him, but I know who it is. And I think, I think that's absolutely right. He's a big player in the field and I'm really surprised at his numbers, but they're growing. So yeah, you better I see like what his, you're doing. You better there. like his, uh, his post. <laughs> no worries. All right. So let's, uh, let's review these six and then we're going to move on to the next portion of the show. Um, we have number one, cash reserves, securing HELOCs, deal analysis, revised lease for your future and now partnerships and mindset. Those are the five, or I'm sorry, those are the six things that we are even doing right now as rookies and every single one of you good should be looking into minimum those six things during this 
time. Let's move on to the next topic we have today. Sure. Felipe and I had a lot of fun getting to write our own show today. <laughs> We did. So we're going to talk about what we're doing right now, what current deals yeah. do we have going on, and if they've been affected at all. So why don't you talk to me first about, I saw it posted on Instagram about uh, a deal that you have under contract. Earlier, I talked about the deal that I'm in, and it, that all comes from these six things, right? I have cash reserves. I secured long-term debt. I'm still analyzing deals, um, good partnerships, and good mindset. So I found this property for one ninety nine nine. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm used to paying 220 for that. The market's maybe shifting a little. I put in a crazy low ball offer of 185, right? And that's unheard of 30 days ago, right? I would have I would have been paying five thousand, ten thousand dollars more, but the the market's shifting. So I offered fifteen thousand dollars less or whatever that number looks like. But I offered 185 mm -hmm. and I got the deal. Now I actually want to buy it for 175. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna use my $300 inspection. What my inspector does is he gives me a full report and past that, he actually now has a system in place where a third party company will tell him exactly how much they will charge to fix every single wow. thing on that report. Yeah, so do I you wanna share that. that. Can you share that company? I actually don't know what it's called, but I'll tell you okay. what, I'll get it to, I'll get yeah, it to you guys out. and I'll post it on my Instagram if I can, if I can't get it to the show notes. But I, I don't remember what it's called, but it's just a third party company that will yeah. literally dollar for dollar exactly how much they will charge to fix it. And I use that as leverage. Typically mm -hmm. that number comes like 30, 40 grand. And I'm like, Hey guys, if you give me half of that off the purchase price and some towards closing, we'll continue with this deal. If not, I'm pulling yeah. out. And then I get it down to the lowest possible pro uh, you know, number that I can and uh, you know, moving forward with the deal. And then as if you follow me on Instagram or YouTube, um, you know that on there, that's, the, that's my number that I use for the rehab, the equity in the property that I get, let's say it's 20 grand, I typically like to stay within that 20 grand to uh, you know, fix my property. So stay tuned guys, uh, uh, the inspection is Monday and I'll let you guys know how that goes. Follow Felipe at Felipe Mejia REI to stay up to date on this deal. <laughs> you always say it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's how you follow me on Instagram. So right now I don't, I well actually I do have one deal under contract. My husband is buying another farm and it has a um, hundred acres with a barn and then a manufactured home and then two single family houses on it. And wow. we actually found out it's going to have to be a short sale. So this will be our first time doing a short sale. Luckily we received our commitment letter from the bank um, right when like this pandemic kind of hit the US. So no, nothing was crazy with the SBA loans or anything like that yet. So everything is rolling along. Um, we've ordered the appraisal, everything like that. So that deal has not been affected by that yet. And then the next thing I'm working on- What about on, your rehab? Yeah, that's what I, I was just gonna say now. So I have my rehab going on for a commercial building I purchased. I started the rehab in December we've been rehabbing one retail unit and then completely gutted and started um, a one bedroom apartment that we're working on. And right uh, now I have uh, my partner, he's uh, tiling the bathroom floor right now. So <laughs> I'm getting excited that it's like getting closer and closer to being done. And actually it's kind of uh, worked in my favor because he right now would be uh, doing landscaping. He has a landscaping company and the, he cannot do that because in New York State, you know, it's a essential services only. So landscaping, sure. people's yards is not. And so he's had a lot of time to work on the rehab. Putting him to work. Week. But that's yeah. the crucial of a partnership, right? You're doing right. this and he's out there working and he's not like, hey, Ashley, you don't need to be doing that. You need to be helping me here work. Like that's right. the importance of partnerships that he's out there working. He's letting you do your thing because you're also out there working a lot. So sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but and I love I, that. And I did uh, deliver him a coffee and breakfast this morning too, because I, I did feel bad that I wasn't there to help this morning. <laughs> you're so. going to do all this tile work. I'll bring you <laughs> yeah. some coffee. Yeah. That's hilarious. But um, I I have been thinking about if our, so I'm kind of doing this as a burr strategy. So I purchased it, I'm rehabbing, then I'm going to rent it out, and then I'm going to go refinance it and yeah. then repeat it for another property. But I am Perfect. curious as to if this will affect my refinance. As of right now, we're planning to refinance hopefully in July. Um, mm -hmm. Once we have everything rented and we still have one more unit, uh, we need to renovate in there. Mm. 
So uh, it will be interesting to see. Um, as of right now, we have cash into the deal only. Um, so it's it's not like we have a, a mortgage payment we have to worry about, but we're still paying nice. holding costs such as you know insurance, property taxes on it. And actually our insurance is pretty high on it just because we are doing the rehab. So I would like to, to switch over to a more long-term insurance policy um, once get we do out of finish that. up the rehab. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And then Ashley, um, go ahead and shout out your Instagram because I want to <laughs> tell people about. You don't know uh, it that you can't shout it out. Well, from rentals. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I wanted you to say it though. Okay. Anyways, go follow, go follow Ashley on wealth from rentals on Instagram guys. She posts great videos on how she does her rehabs. And I think it's really crucial because you get ideas on, Oh, maybe I could do that, you know, or do this, um, or maybe use your kids for labor. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, <laughs> Ashley does yeah. that. I'm just saying. <laughs> I love when your kids come in with like a box or something and they're like <laughs> looking around and you're in there like grinding it out and your, your kids are walking in like, what's, I love that. They're going to really appreciate that when I get, I can't wait to uh, I use my son for free labor yeah, as well. Yeah. Let's move on to our segment called the real estate rookie request line. So this is where you guys can call in and leave us a voicemail with your question. Um, Today, we have actually two voicemails uh, for Felipe and I to answer. So you can call in at 1-888-5-ROOKIE and leave us a voicemail at any time, and we could play yours on a show. So go ahead, uh, Felipe. I'll let you answer the first one. This is Josh from North Jersey. Oh, the question about a quadplex that my wife and I are looking at. We're going to be first-time home buyers and wanted to use that extra leverage that you get with being a first-time home buyer try and get into a large quadplex, but in North Jersey here, it's over a million dollars, and conventional financing might not be the easiest thing to do. How would you guys recommend going about trying to get seller financing on this kind of a deal? Thanks. To answer Josh, one of the first things that I would do is I'd make sure I run my numbers, right? I would make sure that I have the numbers down tight conservatively. And if the numbers work with saying, hey, I'm going to move into one side, you know, I'm going to be able to rent the others for cash flow, I don't see why a bank wouldn't finance it. And if you have to get seller financing from uh, whoever is is selling that property, you know, just make sure that you have a large down payment down or find out what the seller really wants. Sometimes the seller doesn't necessarily want money. I have found in the past that if I find out what the seller really wants and needs and I can meet that need, then we can come to an agreement. I would tell Josh, don't go in just assuming that the seller wants money. If it's maybe an older gentleman or an older couple or whatever the case may be, and they're like, well, you know what? I still want the cash flow, but I just don't want the headache anymore. You know what? What if I can match the cash flow every single month, but you don't have the prop the property anymore? So I'll give you the same amount of cash flow and you don't have to worry about the tenants. I'll take over for that. Or, you know, what if they just want a large lump sum to get their kids through college? Figure out a way to do that. So find out what the seller really wants because it's not always money. Build that relationship with that person if you have to do seller financing. Find out what they need. Try to meet that need. That's what I would tell Josh. Yeah, and I think Josh, maybe he's referring to that, you know, it's, since it's over a million dollars that, you know, it's a huge down payment if you're going the conventional way where maybe seller financing, you know, that down payment would not be as big up front. So it would be easier to get into the deal. And my recommendation would be to, write it out, write out your offer, lay out the numbers. When I did seller financing uh, for a guy, I asked for it. Um, he didn't offer it at first. And I wrote down like, this is the interest rate I would um, pay. And this is what my monthly payment would be to you. And this is how much interest you would make. And then I added that interest to the purchase price and said, look at, you're actually going to be making this much off of me. Even though I'm only offering this purchase price, you're still going to be getting this much interest off of it. And I would also um, supply him with some uh, financials about you, you know, whether it's your tax return or your credit report, um, you know, maybe credit references from banks or, you know, uh, maybe other people who have loaned you money or something like that. Make sure he can see that you're you are going to pay and that you're a reliable person, because that can be scary for someone who is doing seller financing if they don't know you um, and that you know, how are they going to judge if you can pay or not and give them that information up front, showing them that you don't want to hide anything about yourself and that you are credible and you will pay. So I think the more information you give them, the the better chances you will have of, of getting that seller financing. You give way better answers than I do. 
I'm even <laughs> listening. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> Take the okay. next one, Ashley. I'm not going to argue there with you. <laughs> <Just> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next question we have is... Hi, my name's Brenna Crow. I'm currently living in Boston, Massachusetts. And my question is, when using the Burr strategy, what's the difference with using traditional bank lending versus hard money, especially how it affects your cash flow after refinancing? I'm currently working on my first Burr deal, and it's out of state in Virginia. So aside from being super nervous, I'm a little confused on how using hard money and and traditional lending differ. If we refinance, is it going to lower the cash flow? We're going to be putting 25% down and have the property under agreement for 140,000. I think the renovations are going to be about 30,000 and then afterwards it'll probably be worth around 210 to 220. Um, on the low end, the rent for both units combined would be about 1750. Thank you guys so much for doing this podcast. It's been so helpful and I look forward to learning so much more from you guys. I'm going to talk a little bit about the question that she has. And if you'll run the burr part of it, that would be great. Okay. Well, so do one you want, of the can things... you go first to talk about yeah. what the difference between bank lending and ver versus hard money? Talk about and that. hard money. What uh, hard uh, money if, is. I would say, okay, so the biggest difference between bank lending and hard money is hard money is going to have a higher interest rate and it's going to come from a private company or someone with a ton of money, um, you know, or something like that. Bank lending is going to have probably better interest rates, but it's going to be harder to get. Um, I traditionally still go for bank lending. I try to keep myself bankable. I try to not be over leveraged. And I try because it's the, it's the least amount or it's the lowest interest rate. So it secures my cash flow to be as high as possible when getting a bank loan. Hard money is typically also on shorter terms. You have to pay that money back quicker, four, five, six years, maybe one year. You never, it just depends on how you set it up. So it's very, very, very important that you read the rules of your hard money versus your bank lending and things like that. But one of the things that I would want to tell uh, Miss Brenna as well is uh, make sure that you know how much rents are. Make sure that you know how much the ARV is going to be. Make sure you know how much the renovations are going to cost. Please, please, please do not assume anything. Don't assume rents are going to be this much. Don't assume the renovation is going to cost as much. Do your due diligence. Have a contractor go through and look at it and give you a hard money within, you know, a, you know, within a couple hundred bucks of how much this should cost. Find out what rents are in that area and what is the minimum you're going to be able to rent that property for and run your numbers based on that. And and lastly, and and one of the most important, if you're going to per the per the deal. Talk to the bank or a couple banks that are going to offer you the refinance on that property. Tell them what you're going to do. Show them the numbers that you can find that on bigger pockets on uh, their calculator there. Uh, run the numbers, take it to the bank and say, hey, can we do a refi on this? And you can even, uh, something that I have found out recently is you can actually start that process and pause it. And what I mean by that is you can actually start the refinance application and finish it once the property is done because they want to see your financials, they want to see your license, they want to see your taxes, they want to see all these things and just say, okay, I want to start the application. You can freeze the application and when you're done with the refinance, then you continue it. And that's something that I learned recently with my refi. They're like I sent in all my information and now I'm able to refinance the property. So you have to have all that in place and make sure that you're not guessing on any of your numbers. Please, please, please don't guess. Make sure that you have solid numbers so you don't have uh, you know, a hiccup or a surprise when you're going to uh, refinance that property. That's what I would tell Ms. Brenna. Yeah, that was really great, Felipe. Great job uh, explaining that. I, let's talk about now, um, if she does refinance, is it going to lower the cash flow? So right now, um, your your mortgage is lower than when you go to refinance, unless you refinance for the same amount. So it really depends how much money are you going to take back out of the deal when you go and refinance, because your mortgage payment could possibly be higher if you're taking more money out. It also depends on the terms of the loan, too. I mean, maybe your first loan is only um, a 15-year amortization, and this new loan would be 30-year amortization, which might make the payments um, a lot closer to what you know the first uh, loan amount was. So there are a bunch of different variables, but it just looking at it, I would say generally, yes, your payment will uh, go up, which would affect your cash flow. If you are going to take more money out of the deal, if you're going to try to take as much money out as you can, 
then your your monthly mortgage payment is going to go up and that would reduce your cash flow. So you need to look at how much money do you want to leave into the deal and then your cash flow will be higher and how much money do you want to take out and your your cash flow will be lower. Well, let's kind of wrap it up uh, going back over our six things rookies should be doing right now. So first we have uh, cash reserves. Two, securing HELOCs, long-term debt. Make sure you are bankable. Um, deal analysis, tighten those numbers up. Practice, practice, practice um, doing that deal analysis. Do your market research. You know, what kind of rents are coming in? Or even if you're a flipper, what, you know, what are the comparable sales in your neighborhood? Track it over the coming weeks. Is it changing? Um, and then uh, number four is uh, revise your lease if necessary. If you think there are things that this pandemic affected that weren't in your lease, go ahead and put them in for any uh, future uh, tenants you have or for lease renewals. Then number five, we have partnerships. You know, look, evaluate your partnerships, not only with your business partners, but with your accountant, your attorney, you know, uh, your property management company, your contractors, how, how is everyone handling uh, what's going on? And then number six is mindset. Set yourself up for success. There are so many great resources online of how to, to get into the right mindset to be a successful real estate investor. You know, if you guys want, we can even um, do some book recommendations too. Do you, at the top of your head, do you know any, um, a, a book you can recommend right now to get yourself into a good mindset, Felipe? A hundred percent. Life and Air is one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Life and Air, Tax-Free Wealth, the second edition. Um, the Burr Strategy book at Bigger Pockets is really, really good if that's the way that you want to go. I think that's a really, really good book too. Yeah, yeah. Those are all great books. And the one I would add that I'm reading right now is The Daily Stoic, talking about, uh, you know, a great impact on uh, m mindset. I, I like the way it makes you think a little differently. Okay. Agreed, and uh, anything else you want to add today to today's show, Felipe? No, I think those were great. And I'm glad people are listening to the show. Um, definitely, you know, rewind this, listen to those six again individually, and then take a little bit of notes. I know that I'm actually going to go back and listen to what you said. Um, you know, not that I'm like creeping to see if you're a potential partner, but I want to see what you're doing <laughs> during this time. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, I think that was great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. And don't forget to check out our Facebook page, the real estate rookie. I am Ashley Kerr, and you can find me at Wealth From Rentals. And my co-host is the Gap model, <laughs> Mr. Felipe Mejia. And you can find him on Instagram at Felipe Mejia, R-E-I. And you can shop his looks on his Instagram. Oh, my gosh. No, you can't. All right, guys. We'll see you later. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye, Ashley. <laughs>